So I went to the biggest audio conference in the United States and perhaps the world, and I wanna tell you about it. I got to see all of the latest product designs from a ton of different companies. I got to talk to the engineers, the designers, the CEOs behind some of these major audio companies, and I wanna let you know all about it. And I'm of course talking about NAM or North American Musical Merchants. This is where the entire industry comes together under one unified area, and traditionally, retailers and people that actually sell the gear learn about all the new gear and bid on what they wanna put in their store. But more recently, beyond just retailers and merchants, a lot of influencers have been invited to the show, and I hate to refer to myself as that tagline, but I got invited to the show. So here's a rundown of some of the things I got to see at the NAMM show that were microphone related that I thought were really awesome. If you want to see any of this gear on the channel, I got the contact info for pretty much everyone that you're going to see here, so let me know. Red alert, we have a red alert here. Everyone stay aware, be aware of what is about to happen because we have a Discord now. As promised, at 7,500 subs, I would make a Discord and I have done exactly that. So go down in the description. The invite link is gonna be there. You can see how I've made it and you can give me some suggestions because I don't really know what I'm doing. <laughs> but finally, we have a place for the entire community to nerd out and all of our audio nerdiness together. I would also like to thank the sponsor of today's video let me go get it ridge wallets that is correct there it is the premier minimalist wallet brand you guys have heard my spiel about it before but i really want to focus today on the fact that it's really an amazing father's day gift my father actually called and wanted one of these once he saw it on the video and he was like yeah i would like a ridge wallet for my father's day gift so i have firsthand anecdotes to tell you that this is going to be an amazing gift they come in a bunch of really cool different colors that range from burnt titanium to north shore which is what i have here which is like a beautiful topographic map on a mountain. I'll give you some B-roll of it. Ridge wallets fit really well into your front pocket, which is great for places like New York or if you're traveling because you're not going to get it taken out of the back pocket. It's easier for sitting down. It's not going to hurt your butt. And on top of that, it's RFID blocking. So you're not going to get your identity stolen or anything like that. Because it's so small, it is about half the size or even like a third of the size of my old wallet. It's really been much easier to travel with. I bike with it in my back pocket. It doesn't fall out at all. It's never uncomfortable. And one thing I haven't brought up yet is Ridge makes amazing commuter backpacks that I've also been using for like the last month. And I mean, every day I used it to go to NAM. I carried all of my tech in this bag. It's also got RFID blocking. It has a place for a charger. It has an independent laptop sleeve with amazing fabric. This one is rip proof. They make a weatherproof one as well. And all of this you can get for 15% off with code AudioHaze, or you can use the link down below. Trust me, it's going to make an amazing gift. So first and foremost, our friends over at Austrian Audio, the designers of my favorite condenser microphone, the OC818. One of the most exciting things they launched this year was the OC16, which is the same capsule as the OC818 and the OC18, put in a form factor that is more competitive with like the AKG C214. Meaning for a lot of you out there looking for a budget microphone, you can really seriously consider this one. And again, it has the same capsule the same beating heart as the OC818, which is about $1,200. So let's hear what Austrian Audio themselves have to say about this microphone. We have a lot of people who really like the sound signature of our ceramic capsule. Yeah. And also we have also the OC18, which is the variant that only has cardioid pattern. Yeah. That still retails for seven to 800 bucks. So that's quite an investment for aspiring artists. Right. So what we did here is we took the same capsule that also resides in the OC18, so the cardioid capsule, and put in, in a bit of a simpler housing with simpler electronics and made it a very affordable piece of microphone with okay. the same sound signature. So this will retail for $399. Yes, you lose a bit of the controls, you don't have a pad here, also the capsule is quite sustainable against high SPL, so it's not that big of okay. a problem. We have a slightly higher noise floor uh, because of the simpler electronics and okay. the housing is a bit more simple, but still, we have this nice sound signature of the ceramic capsule from Vienna. The capsule is all Vienna made. 
This is really appealing to me. The fact that we're getting the same capsule as in the OC818, as I said in the video, my favorite condenser microphone, and we're putting it into a form factor that is more along the lines of like an AKG C214 in price. We do lose a little bit whenever it comes to the actual casing. We're not getting as nice of a seal on the grill. It's a little bit of uh, a simpler design, less of a complex shock mount, but all things that are really necessary and it's an extremely nice pro level capsule being placed in a more affordable casing. I'm so glad they did this. They've also released a number of dynamic microphones that change the game for live purpose. A lot of really cool innovations there. Let's hear about those. Here we have the OD303. That's a passive dynamic microphone still with the open acoustics. That's the part here that makes it a bit harder for the unexperienced singer to cover uh -huh. all the back of the microphone, <laughs> which alters the sound signature yeah. and uh, ruins the cut and pattern. Right, smart. Um, so, if you didn't know, this is what he's kind of referring to here. With these microphones, with a Shure SM58 uh, or anything that, you know, artists have on stage, they tend to put the capsule like right up to the ring of their hand. And what that actually does is really drastically increases the low end. You get a really muffled sound and I promise you, your sound engineer is gonna hate you. This is their solution to this. I thought it was to mitigate handling noise and I'm sure to an extent that is what it's doing. But on top of that, you can put your hand there, which every singer for some reason wants to put their hand there, and you're not going to be messing with the capsule. Pretty smart. Also with this microphone, we have already implemented uh, the pop filter. This is a custom design pop filter here. Really allows you, if there's coming a lot of wind from the side, to distribute it even ah. over the capsule. This helps a lot for people who have a bit of a, yeah, a explosive uh, Totally. Right, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, That's really smart. Yeah. <laughs> smart. What they've done is they've actually changed the geometry of the pop filter in front of the capsule so it's pointed, therefore splitting up the airways and the plosives aren't going to hit nearly as hard. The OD505 is an active dynamic microphone. Oh, okay. It needs phantom power. That's the first one. Uh, it has a bit of an amplifier inside, but this gives you the possibility um, to have uh, a high pass filter uh, even on a dynamic microphone uh, because if we would do that uh, with a passive version then the um, sound of the high pass filter would depend on the input impedance of your preamp or your mixing console the same capsule as the 303 uh -huh. but uh, in a bit of a different configuration here we have the OC707 uh -huh. that's a true condenser vocal microphone um, it has a con Vienna made condenser capsule uh -huh. the whole microphone is made in Vienna oh, wow. um, as well as the 505 that's also made in Vienna um, also has this open acoustic on the back here that I explained before um, also this microphone can withstand a lot of SPL and has uh, also uh, high pass filter yeah. um, and you, this is super cardioid, right, I would assume? Yeah, that's a cardioid. And finally, some studio dynamic microphones that, again, are offering a lot of cool design features that you're not going to find in any other brand. This is the OC7. Uh, it's a true condenser instrumental microphone. It features the same capsule that we also have in the CC8 and uh, OC707, but we have given it a very robust design here with a good suspension, so this microphone can even take some drum hits, uh, hits from drumsticks, and it has a very nice feature, and this is this swivel joint here. You see here, that's especially handy if you have already set up all the drum set, set up all the st stands, yeah. and then you want to do small alterations yeah, very nice. without fiddling around with the whole thing, yeah. you can alter it. So this is cool, and a really good idea. A lot of instrument microphones are kind of hard to get the position of. You gotta adjust based on the mic clip, you gotta make a lot of adjustments on the fly, tighten it, untighten it. It's a bit of a time sink. So a really robust, rotatable capsule to get that perfect snare tone, really smart idea. The hyperspoke from the pad. What I want to mention to the pad is that you really reduce the voltage on the capsule. Uh -huh. This really helps to make the capsule more robust against loud sounds. Okay. So this uh, microphone can withstand 160 dB wow. uh, in sound pressure level with the pad, uh, roughly 100. 
54 without the pad. Okay. Um, so that's really even sufficient for yeah, like very motivated trumpet players, for example. <laughs> or you can even take it on drums. Okay, next place I went to was Audient, which is a company I've always wanted to review, but I haven't gotten the chance yet. I know they have some of the cleanest, quietest preamps out there, and I've gotten a few limited chances to try an Audient interface. But what I didn't know was the history of Audient and how they started out not really on this kind of small end spectrum of the Evos or the ID series, but actually large, giant studio consoles. So let's hear about the history of Audient and what they have to say about the Evo and the ID4 from Audient themselves. Back in uh, 1997, 98, David did and made the first Audient console, which was the 8024. So we have the 4816 here, the smaller console which came after. The 8024 was very much the, the Audient product for a number of years, and then slowly they started branching into other things. We had the smaller consoles, we had mic preamps, yeah. and then eventually moving digital and bringing out the first audio interface was ID22. And since then it's been, yeah, moving as the world's been getting a bit more digital as it were. So these were, they were always designed to be more studio, right. top level sort of products. Whereas now we've also moved down into the prosumer kind of realm with Evo. I want to say it has a little bit more gain than the average. Interface, or am I right there? Like around 60? High 50s of okay. game, yeah. uh, basically. But I think one of the one of the things that we pride ourselves on with both the Audion and Evo is the fact that we design everything to be as like low noise, like yeah. soft noise as possible. Super so clear. in some of the other cheaper brands, it's like, oh yeah, don't you don't want to turn it up all the way because it's yeah. just going to yeah. hiss at you. Whereas with these, it's like just you know, if you've got a SM7B type thing, yeah, just whack it up all the way. And, you, and you're fine. Boost it in post, like, you, you, and you'll be good because it sounds great as opposed to like Trust a, me, that's what everyone wants to exactly, hear. <laughs> exactly. One thing that I thought was really interesting about the Evo series is they have a smart gain feature, which basically means that it'll set the game to be around optimal levels like negative 12 dB on its own. Again, something I would like to test. So this is the okay. smart gain feature. So you basically would press that, select the channels that you want to use, whether it's just one of them or two of them. Okay. Uh, if you have a one of the bigger Evo interfaces, you could do it with up to eight channels on the Evo 16. Oh. And it will basically automatically set the gain for you. The ID series, I really was curious as to what separates the ID series from the Evo series. And the ID series actually, going back to those consoles that started the whole Audient line, they have the same level of preamps that you would find in a large console in a studio environment in the ID series. So if you're looking for a truly pro audio sound, something that you would find in a large studio setting, the ID series have one of those preamps or more of them built in to that one individual console. How would you distinguish between the ID series and the Evo series? What are we getting yeah. between the two? The ID series, I would say, represents the more pro level uh, equipment. So yeah. even though the ID4 is a you know a small one one preamp uh, interface, the actual heritage of it comes from you know the console, the mic preamps, like the, the 20 plus years of experience we have. So whereas the Evo, I would say it's been engineered sort of from the ground up in a sense. Whereas this, yeah, these these come from our console heritage. The Evo is like right. Let's do something new. Audion is also releasing a package deal where you can get the Evo and also an Evo microphone along with it as sort of a, a My First Studio kind of pack. I know Personas has done it in the past. I know Focusrite has a very popular version of this packet. So something to test out too. We have a, a large diaphragm condenser coming with the Evo. Okay, so the next place I wanna talk about is AEA, which is actually pretty much exclusively ribbon microphones. Ribbon microphones are some of the oldest microphone designs in terms of capsules. And they have their own tonal characteristics and they are also characterized typically by a bi-directional recording scheme, meaning they pick up the front and behind them. They're traditionally pretty dark and they're also pretty sensitive. When I say sensitive, I kind of mean that in two different ways. They're sensitive like a condenser, they're going to pick up a lot of the room around them, but they are also sensitive in the fact that they're traditionally pretty fragile microphones, meaning you kind of have to watch SPL levels, how loud you're recording things around them. I wouldn't use them on a kick drum, if you know what I mean. Well, AEA has something to say about that because not only do they have beautiful recreations of old golden age microphones and improvements on them, they're taking ribbon microphones and innovating on their designs and putting them in some really crazy scenarios like a pop. 
podcasting microphone. Talking about something like the KU5A, which is a cardioid ribbon microphone. So you have a ribbon, you got to basically block the back of it and send it into this thing called a labyrinth. So this is an acoustical labyrinth full of uh, fiberglass and a couple other top secret materials. Um, <laughs> what that does is basically creates like an anechoic chamber behind it. So you're talking into it and it sends it into the back and, and diffuses it and then blocks the sides. The way to think about it in terms of polar pattern is like, like pushing the back of the uh, bi-directional pattern and like uh -huh. sort of squishing it. There, there are other popular podcasting mics that I'm not supposed to name out loud. But, uh, <laughs> You know, this is like our entry to that. It's sort of based on the um, okay. RCA BK5, similarly the uh, Toshiba Type H, I think is what it is. Okay. Cardioid ribbon microphone. Kind of strange. And something really interesting because they've kind of pitched this as like a podcaster's voiceover microphone. And as many of you know, a lot of people like their voiceover to be pretty dark, pretty mellow. That way for long extended listening periods, you don't hear a lot of sibilance or brightness that kind of wears down your ear. Ribbons are inherently pretty dark sounding mellow microphones. So if they've kind of nailed down the rejection of this microphone, you might have a winner here and something unlike anything else on the market. Question, how does, for a podcasting scenario, how does a ribbon sound, especially whenever it's gonna be a cardioid? You yeah. know, the, I've never heard that before. They're definitely gonna sound a little bit darker. Yeah. Um, so, you know, with the, with the dynamic, for example, the, the top end's gonna sound a little bit like slushy, you know, right. like with the S's, it can't really handle uh -huh. those transients. Um, and like, this has those transients, but like, they're a little bit low in the mix. So, we also sell preamps like, <laughs> Carry um, on. <laughs> we also sell preamps that boost the high gain. Oh, nice. So, or sorry, that boost the high frequencies. Um, right. So you have the curve gain, the curve frequency. You can go from 2.5k to uh, 30k, and this is, I think, up to 20 dB of gain, um, where that peak is. It's, yeah, it would be the go-to uh, for podcast mic, and like I'm sure people would talk to you and let you know, like, oh wow, this sounds very detailed. It yeah. sounds like you are talking into my ear. Okay, so. I'm gonna do the old YouTube transition there. We're gonna split this up into two different videos. If I were to do the whole NAMM show in one video, it'd be an hour long and I would have already lost you guys. So look out for part two, hopefully a little bit later this week. We got a bunch of other cool companies that are announcing a bunch of other cool gear. If you want, you can follow me on Instagram at Real Audio Haze, or if you wanna work on a project with me, you can email me at realaudiohaze at gmail.com. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs>